Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Insights 2022. I'm Crystal Munoz, the Immigration Policy Analyst here at GBPI. I wanted to give a quick thanks to our previous panelists for such an in-depth conversation. GBPI Policy Conference provides an opportunity for us to hear the thoughts of our lawmakers on a variety of issues so that attendees know what's happening under the gold dome. Sometimes that means narratives and policies that GBPI does not agree with uh, representing. We remain committed to advancing racial equity, which often requires uncomfortable conversations like the ones you've just heard. We hope this panel can serve as an opportunity to represent the solutions that we believe advances equity and opportunity for all Georgians, particularly Black women and other people of color. And now for our next panel, Racial Equity and the Budget, where you'll hear our analysts do a deep dive on the governor's proposed budget pertaining to each of GBPI's policy areas with a focus on racial and gender equity and implications for workers in the caring ecosystem. Then we'll move into the Q&A portion of the panel towards the end. And now I'd like to introduce our analyst. Ray Kalfani, Policy Analyst for Worker Justice and Criminal Legal Systems. Ife Finch Floyd, Senior Policy Analyst for Economic Justice. David Schaefer, Research Director covering healthcare. Jennifer Lee, Senior Policy Analyst for Higher Education. Dr. Stephen Owens, policy analyst for, 12, for K through 12, and Danny Canzo, senior policy analyst for tax and budget and our government coordinator. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ray. Thank you, Crystal. Bear with me one moment, I'm gonna share my screen. That looks a little bobbly there right now. Yeah, right. Almost there. I think that's it. Don't think that's it. I'm having a little bit of tech difficulty. One second. Almost there. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Ray Calafani, Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, and just uh, today I'm going to speak to you. You know, I, I handle the uh, Worker Justice and Criminal Legal Systems portfolio, and you know, today I'm going to speak to you about um, you know the, the moral documents that take place um, when we look at uh, the Department of Labor. And, and looking at that, um, I'll, I'll go right into what we have. You know, if we compare um, you know, the proposed AF, AFY 2022 um, Department of Labor, Labor Budget with FY 2022, we find increases uh, covering $5,000 pay raises for eligible full-time staff, while all, the, while all the line items remain the same. But however, when comparing the proposed FY 2023 budget with that of FY 2022, you know, there are significant spending increases, which cover $5,000 cost of living adjustments for eligible staff, uh, greater benefits for retirees, a large realloc reallocation of state dollars to the technical college system in Georgia. And you know, while the total Department of Labor, Labor budgets over the fiscal years of 2021 and 2022 have maintained pandemic budget cuts, between 1.1 million and one point, I'm sorry, between 1 million and 1.1 million below that of pre-pandemic FY 2020. Uh, proposed spending for FY 2023 seeks to slash nearly half the Department of Labor's state spending from FY 2022. So you know the nearly $7.2 million reallocation of workforce development related funding to the technical college system of Georgia, including staff positions, equipment, and property account for the majority reduce Department of Labor spending from FY 2022 and FY 2023. So, you know, regarding state funding, the, the total 
FY2023 budget is 52% smaller than FY2022 and 56% smaller than the pre-pandemic budget of, 20, of the 2020 budget. Now, federal dollars make up the majority of spending in the Depart for Department of Labor's operations, you know, through a number of grants covering much of the direct cost of administering UI and, and employment services. And just as a large chunk of state dollars have been redirected to the um, technical college system in Georgia for workforce development operations, a large chunk of federal workforce development dollars are being real, real, reallocated to the technical college system as well. And you know, when we look at um, like fe federal numbers, you know, compared to state numbers, here we go. Um, you know, we see that you know the, the federal spending is a lot larger um, than what we have for the state. Um, and, and I just want to back up a little bit, um, and just, just so I can make sure I'm laying out as far as what I want to do today. I, I want to highlight two things. You know, one is you know the Department of Labor's budgets, which I I did in the beginning, but also discuss you know the implications surrounding racial and gender equity in the care workforce. Um, you know, as an AZ serving one of several layers of a critical social safety net. You know, the Department of Labor is tasked with providing a protective floor for involuntary jobless Georgians. And since the start of the COVID pandemic, the Department of Labor has administered an unemployment insurance safety net that has processed over 5.1 million claims and paid out billions in benefits to Georgians who turn to the UI safety net. It's tasked with administering a UI safety net that's financed by, st by state and federal UI taxes, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and, and as is um, visual shows. Um, and it has a critical task of maintaining consumer spending levels that prevent economic collapse, but more importantly, prevent human suffering among involuntary jobless workers during economic downturns and providing them with a bridge back to good, well-matched jobs. This ensures that the economy grows faster and that Georgians don't get trapped in low-quality jobs that depress their lifetime earnings. So, as I continue, you know, as, as my other analysts, as our, my fellow analysts will do as well, you know, today's panel will highlight the moral choices that are outlined in the state's budget proposals. And for Georgia Department of Labor, it will highlight not only proposals for how the AC spends its public investments, but also how it accumulates investments meant to protect Georgia's workforce. So, and what I just mentioned, you know, talking about, you know, fiscal year 2022 to, 20, to, to the new budget in 2023, you know, you know, what do these state spending priorities mean? You know, so, you know, when it with increased spending, you know, in two separate allocations, you know, five five thousand dollar pay raises to full time eligible employees for amended fiscal year 2022 and five thousand dollar cost of living increases within FY 2023, the, the Department of Labor, you know, full time employees will receive more competitive pay that will help them to keep pace with inflation. Now, current retirees will also receive a, a cost of living adjustment and current eligible staff will receive an increased 401k employer match and future retirees will have a greater payout for accrued leave benefits. Now, the remaining workforce development services handled by the Department of Labor, which I spoke of earlier, as far as you know, the, the, the reallocation of, of funding, you know, you know, which are employment services, which are employment services programs for eligible UI claimants, that's going to be transferred to the TSG which currently administers a number of other workforce programs, including adult education, job training, and career counseling. Now, these spending priorities would also though, serve as a missed opportunity to restore funding for vacant positions that were removed as part of pandemic budget cuts. Beyond the staffing capacity issues that were presented during the heightened periods of UI claims enrollment in 2020 and 2021, the FY 2023 budget fails to restore funds to meet pre-pandemic staffing levels that were in place to handle the needs of unemployed Georgians during normal economic periods. Simply put, unemployment protections are necessary for any and all economic periods, not just when we have excessive bleeding of jobs during recessions. And furthermore, you know, these budget priorities reflect a missed opportunity to invest in modernizing Georgia's UI system, which was heavily tested during the height of the pandemic recession and failed to meet a number of federal federal performance standards, including those of claims processing and overpayment and underpayment detection, which resulted in countless jobless Georgian having to face unspeakable human suffering during the COVID-induced recession. 
and as, as a result, not being able to access unemployment protections when they needed them the most. So you know, these budget priorities reflect Georgia's choices to maintain inadequate access to UI, particularly when compared to several other states that have taken greater steps to modernize their UI systems. And, and while other states have faced many of the same challenges, you know, installing new programming to administer the federal pandemic UI programs to save many jobless workers from unspeakable poverty, they also pursued pandemic response strategies to better serve those in need, including new tools to assist UI recipients, new technologies to assist those filing claims, and formalized actions to protect against identity, identity theft and fraud. So, you know, Georgia so far has only pursued pandemic response strategies to improve reemployment services. And while, while important, you know, those strategies have not addressed needs to, to improve benefit access. And I want to be clear, you know, by saying that the infrastructure and modernization issues that impact Georgia's UI system can be significantly attributed to underfunding at the federal level. But Georgia policymakers have a responsibility that cannot be ignored to make equitable choices that maintain dedicated revenue sources to ensure that our state maintains efficiency of our UI system through the ebbs and flows of federal funding. And then, you know, also on the other side, you know, I want to speak on the revenue side of Georgia's Department of Labor's budget because, you know, revenue is just as important as spending. And, you know, as you already know, you know, the unemployment benefits by Georgia's that are paid out, they're paid out of Georgia's uh, Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund, which is uh, paid for by tax revenue that employers provide. You know, too often, you know, Georgia leaders have made the harmful choice of restricting benefit access in order to decrease the level of responsibility of employers to contribute revenue to keep the trust fund solvent. And you know, this is the shameful side of Georgia's quest to be the number one state to do business uh, because our state restricts access to benefits to, to prioritize business interests over those of its workers. And you know, the consequences of inadequate program financing fall squarely on the most disadvantaged workers, disproportionately affecting communities of color who bear the brunt of these choices and have historically been left behind recession after recession. So, you know, with increased diversity in our state, you know, particularly across race and ethnicity, Georgia has a unique, a uniquely heavy responsibility to ensure that its UI system does not create or perpetuate barriers to prevent Georgians from accessing it when they need it, particularly those who have been excluded for generations, many of whom are skilled workers in our care industry. So I'll stop there and I'll open it up for any questions that you may have, Crystal. Um, welcome to speak on you know, any, any questions as, as far as the Georgia Department of Labor's budget. Ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm doing two presentations today on the Georgia Department of Corrections. I, I, jumped, I jumped a little bit, but uh, go ahead, Crystal. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Hey, thank you, Ray. Um, we can head to uh, Ife next. Ah, gotcha. Thank you so much, Ray, for that presentation. Um, and just give me a moment to pull up uh, my slides as well. All right, so I'm going to cover the Department of Human Services and um, uh, just a, a slice of the Department of Early Care and Learning Budget, um, uh, looking at child care services. So let's start with DHS. The Department of Human Services budget um, uh, proposed budget by the governor for amended fiscal year 2022 is about $851 million, and that's up from the FY 2022 budget of $817 million. Um, the governor's proposed FY 2023 budget is about $903 million. So looking at the proportions of what state funds um, uh, the state funds uh, contribute to the whole department's budget. Um, it's a fair amount, um, but federal funds make up more than half of DHS's uh, whole budget. So the governor's proposed budget 
um, is about $86 million more than, um, than what we saw for fiscal year 2022. Um, and about $73 million more than what we saw in fiscal year 2020. Um, and really the remainder, I should have said this at the top, the remainder of my comments will focus on uh, fiscal year 2023. So the vast majority um, or the majority of the, um, maybe a, closer to more than half of the 60, uh, excuse me, $86 million increase over FY22 is again um, in the pay increases for full-time state employees and the associated benefits around annual leave and retirement. However, there's also a $27.8 million increase, um, which will represent a 10% increase um, in the out of care home, uh, out of home care provider rate. And then there's also a $4.3 million um, for capital improvements for a vocational rehabilitation program. So some other notable um, increases in the governor's budget include investment in more investment in child welfare services and foster care services, particularly around prevention um, and bolstering support for children in, in foster care and, or the child welfare system and their families. So for example, there's $1.5 uh, $1 million pilot to support children who are in or at risk of entering foster care. Um, and also a $452,000 um, pilot um, for Region 12 to diagnose children for autism and then uh, provide appropriate services for those children. And then looking at out of home care or foster care, um, the governor proposes utilizing some existing funds, about $6.7 million, to improve the continuum of care, um, including prevention and therapeutic um, services. And specifically for those therapeutic services, this means providing specialized treatment for children with an assortment of behavioral, mental, and developmental challenges as well. So what does this mean um, for, for DHS? So as has, uh, was said before by Danny and, and Ray, you know, this investment in the workforce um, by, uh, by increasing pay um, is, is really um, an enc encouraging to see. Um, for the past couple of years, we've seen a reduced DHS budget during a global pandemic which has increased hardship for many Georgians. Um, and DHS as an agency lost about 600 staff between 2019 and 2021. So the pay increase will boost the modest incomes of DHS and state, other state workers um, who nearly half of which are, are black workers and more than half of which are, are women workers. Um, and it really will boost the pay for some of the, the um, lowest paid workers in DHS. So yesterday, DHS Commissioner Bros um, said in the budget hearing that the pay increase would um, increase um, pay for child, new child welfare workers by 13 to 14% and would increase child support workers and eligibility workers for um, TANF, SNAP, and Medicaid um, from 16 to 18%. But DHS is still not um, staffed um, fully, and that could negatively impact and affect Georgians who are in need of support or protection from the state. It could mean fewer than needed caseworkers to investigate child abuse, um, and longer processing times for people approving uh, needing benefits. Um, so I took a quick look this morning at uh, census's pulse data, which provide more updated um, analysis uh, around the well being of people across the country and looked at some of Georgia's numbers. And we still see that black and brown families in Georgia are more likely to experience food insecurity um, than white uh, families. And with the child monthly child tax credit not happening this month um, or next month because federal legislators failed to um, expand 
uh, uh, extend the expanded child tax credit, we can expect food insecurity to continue to increase without that additional support. However, the investments in child welfare and foster care really um, are also encouraging. Um, particularly the 10% proposed 10% increase um, in the provider rate for those families and organizations who are caring for children in, in the foster care system is really meaningful because it is um, a huge cost for um, those families to, to take care of those children. And this just helps them better, better afford the essentials that all kids need um, and helps um, families continue to participate in the program and to continue to take care of those children um, instead of uh, getting burned out and struggling to meet their, their basic needs and not, and not being able to care uh, for children in the foster care system. Additionally, preventative measures are also encouraging um, because it means that uh, children um, hopefully can, can either stay in their homes or stay with their families and out of the system altogether. Um, but something that Ray said also um, um, raised for me is that we also need preventative measures um, that include providing families um, with critical supports like food assistance, like additional cash assistance, like, a, uh, like a, a state EITC to help them to continue to care for their children. Um, Georgia Voices for Children notes that neglect, which is often um, caused by having insufficient funds to, to take care of your basic needs and to, and to um, take care of your children, is one of the leading reasons um, why children may be removed from the home. So ensuring that families have what they need to take care of themselves and take care of their families um, is, 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 is another critical preventative measure that I think the state needs to continue to consider as well. So let's move on to childcare services. The amended budget um, for 2022 was about $58 million, and that's about where it was um, in FY 2022. So the governor's um, FY 2023 budget is about $61 million. Again, looking at the proportion of state funds compared to other funds in child care services, um, it's um, only about a quarter. And we see that federal resources make up the majority of funding for child care services. So um, the FY 2023 budget is about $3.2 million over what we saw in FY 2022, um, and just slightly lower than what we saw in FY 2020. And most of that $3.2 million, um, $3 million will go towards the state match for the federal um, uh, child care and development fund. So again, what, what does this mean? So some of you may have heard um, from um, Elisabetta Casfier from DECAL yesterday talking about um, how the state is utilizing release fund, uh, relief dollars from the federal government to bolster um, child care in Georgia to expand, temporarily expand um, the child care subsidy program caps in Georgia by 10,000 slots and add additional stabilization funds to providers. And uh, this increased um, state investment um, can better support those efforts. But really, Georgia um, is not uh, serving as many children as it could with its child care subsidies. Um, and so there really needs to continue to be more state resources um, so that Georgia can make sure that um, eligible children um, can use, uh, can, can receive and take part of those childcare subsidies as well. 
Um, this is going to come up later with uh, my colleague uh, Stephen, but I'm going to tee it up here um, as well. The pay increases in the budget for teachers K through 12 also include uh, pre-K teachers, and some of those pre-K teachers are in um, child, not in public schools, but are in um, in childcare facilities. So what we um, kind of see here with this pay increase, which is great. <laughs> I, am, I am not knocking a pay increase for hardworking um, um, uh, early education teachers, but we do not see uh, childcare workers who are not state employees um, are continuing to have um, the same wages, um, which are often lower than pre-K teachers who may work in the same center. And this really widens um, uh, the, the wage gap. So, um, you know, it, there needs to be significant investment, um, certainly from the federal government. Um, and we, we would hope uh, if Build Back Better um, with its tremendous investment um, in childcare could pass that it could help address some of that, um, some of those wage gaps. Um, but again, still uh, more than half of childcare workers um, are women of color. And um, as we continue to see their wages um, remain flat and low, um, that this is a, a racial and gender equity issue. So I'm going to, to pause there and we'll answer questions at the appropriate time. And then I believe uh, my colleague Devin, uh, 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 David, excuse me, is next. Hello, good morning, everybody, <clears throat> and thank you for uh, joining us today for this panel where we get to do this really deep dive into the budget. I'm David Schaefer. I'm the research director. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about where we are in health. Um, I know we had a really robust conversation at the previous panel uh, with uh, Rose Scott and Danny Canso and the legislators on what some of this means. And so we're going to get into the numbers a little bit and talk about the big picture, uh, diving into each of uh, the health related budgets for the state of Georgia, which is DCH, DPH and DBHDD. So we're gonna start off with DCH. Um, there's some good news in this state's budget. Uh, a lot of which is that we are not in the same place where we were uh, a year ago. We have had some substantial increases of $513 million over FY 2022. That's very strong for FY 2023. And we have a billion dollars that we're ahead of where we were in the pre-pandemic budget, which was FY 2020. So some of the highlights here that I think are very helpful is that we're looking at 180 million to enhance the health benefit. That was an AFY 2022. Um, that is really going to be helpful for teachers and state employees. We've got a pretty major COLA, which is cost of living increase, a cost of living adjustment. You heard from Danny Canso that the state agencies have had substantial turnover in recent years. And these are the individuals that serve the people of the state of Georgia. So certainly keeping and retaining that talent is going to be very important going forward. There will also be a $150 million state funds increase to the loss of, of uh, the enhanced match from the federal government, which was due to the public health emergency. Uh, this was something that was passed in the family's first legislation last year. Uh, there was a bump of 6.2% in the federal match. Uh, I do note that the public health emergency has been extended to April 16, 2022, but given that the FY23 budget will not take effect until July 1, it doesn't really look like it'll get extended again, but it might. So we'll see how this plays out. Uh, there was also an $86 million increase um, due to the matching rate drop for Medicaid and Peach Care. This gets adjusted every year. So this is sort of anticipated, I think, at various times in the budget. A very exciting thing was HB 163, which passed last year, which was what they called express lane enrollment. This was a process by which individuals who were um, uh, signing up for uh, SNAP could also be enrolled in Medicaid at the same time. So it's a very effective use of time. Uh, it allows for less paperwork and it helps families who need these benefits access them in a more equitable way. Uh, and we are really excited about $28 million uh, investment to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage from six to 12 months. This will become effective upon approval by the federal government. This is going to be extremely important because Georgia ranks last in mater maternal mortality rates. And this is especially impactful for women of color, specifically black women. So this investment is going to make a big difference. And we're really excited about this. 
there's also going to be a $21 million investment for the projected growth in low-income Medicaid and some other areas. Uh, you heard from various presentations this morning and conversations that um, Medicaid enrollment has increased. And that has been a result of the pandemic in many cases. We're going to talk about more about what that means in a couple of minutes. And there's also been a $2.5 million investment in 136 new primary care medicine residency spot, slots, which is exciting because these are individuals uh, who will be able to serve the state of Georgia in a more holistic way. So let's talk a minute uh, about things that we heard about a lot on the last panel. And uh, these are the Medicaid waivers that have been submitted um, through the Governor's Patients First Act. Um, and I want to raise up a couple of things here that I think before we get in, I want to explain why Medicaid expansion continues to be the right answer for the state of Georgia. Uh, GBPI did a poll last summer and found that 64.5% of Georgia residents support full Medicaid expansion. So right off the top, it is something that the, that the people of Georgia want and they've identified it as a priority. If we dig a little bit deeper, you'll find that 64.5% also supported ARP funding to strengthen Georgia health, Georgia's healthcare workforce. This is also a big deal. So what the people of Georgia are telling us is we need investment in healthcare and we need it now. So right off the top, I wanted to say that. I also want to say that people who are in the coverage gap are also largely people of color. We're talking about 58 uh, percent of those who are in the coverage gap are people of color. These are uh, immigrant families, many of, of whom who have been scared away from public benefits by public charge and could now be encouraged to come back in by virtue of Medicaid expansion. And these are uh, 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 Black communities as well who are in the coverage gap and Medicaid expansion for these reasons remains a racial equity issue in a big way. Let's talk about the waivers a little bit. The first one is the Medicaid 1115 waiver. Um, this is a waiver that was submitted last year. The feds have rejected the work requirement as you probably heard. Um, if we look at sort of the data around this, uh, with the work requirement, this would have covered 31,000 new people. If we remove the work requirement, it'll cover 269,000. But at the bottom line here is that with full Medicaid expansion, we're talking about 481,000 people, almost double the number of people covered at about a fifth of the cost. So this is a good investment for the people of Georgia. It has a racial equity dimension that is really important. I also want to lift up that Georgia has the opportunity to receive an additional 1.4 to $1.9 billion as a result of expansion now not tomorrow, now. So what could these monies be used on? We could be talking about uh, investments in education. We could keep the QBE up to date for longer. Uh, we could also invest in those priorities that have been identified, some of which have been identified under the ARP uh, for the $4.7 billion investments uh, around broadband, for example, or some of the other things that we could do around expanding workforce development. So I just wanted to, to put this in perspective that, that we do have these waivers on the table. The feds have looked at them pretty much askance, but Medicaid expansion is something that we can do immediately and the people of Georgia have flagged it as such. And it is the equitable, racially equitable thing to do. So we'll dig in a little bit deeper on the second waivers that were submitted. This is the ACA 1332 innovation waiver, also done through the Affordable Care Act um, and also through the Governor's Patients First Act. The phase one of this was a reinsurance program. Um, this is something that is, I think, generally a good idea for many, and we've identified it as such. There's some chunks in the budget that you'll see for this. There's $124 million allotted to the Commissioner of Insurance in FY 2023 for that purpose. The second one that you heard a lot about on the last panel is the Georgia Access Model. Uh, in effect, this would uh, shut down healthcare.gov for the state of Georgia. And uh, this has been rejected by the feds due to the apparent violation of, uh, excuse me, it's likely to be rejected by the feds due to the apparent violation of the statutory guide rails that are provided under the ACA. A comment period was open for this. That period was uh, ended and closed on January 9th. Uh, within the budget, you'll see some items there that are still extant that are around this. 
Uh, one of them is for FY 2023 for $16 million uh, for the online portal and the state health care exchange through the Commissioner of Insurance. And in AFY 2022, you would have seen $8 million in there for the state health care exchange. It's really interesting that these monies are still there because the viability of these waivers is really in question with the exception of the reinsurance program. But uh, as you heard on the previous panel, these waivers were approved under the Trump administration, but they've been subjected to an additional review under the Biden administration. And at the moment, it's not really clear that they're going to go through. Again, Medicaid expansion is needed now. So let's talk a little bit about the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Um, one of the things that I think we've all been hearing throughout the pandemic as to why this department matters and why these funds matter is there is, have been an up, uptick in, um, in inst instances of mental health crises during the pandemic. So we're, we're, we're excited to see some of these additions, which is 129 million in state funds over FY22. We're looking at a lot of good investments since the pre-pandemic budget to the tune of $96.5 million. Some of the top lines we could talk about, 78 million for a $5,000 COLA uh, for full-time employees. A lot of this, 35 million is going into adult mental health services to address some of those crises that we were talking about. Um, again, uh, you heard Danny Canso, our senior policy analyst for tax and budget, refer to it. We have major turnover within agencies, and DBHDD has especially been affected by this during the pandemic. We've also got some slots available for now in comp Medicaid waivers. These are specifically targeted to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, also a very important investment. And then $6.2 million to expand behavioral health and substance abuse crisis capacity. Again, we have a state that has struggled through the pandemic. Individuals with mental health crises have had trouble getting the uh, assistance that they need to keep moving forward, and these investments are going to pay off. So talking a little bit about the Department of Public Health, and just to put this in perspective, this is the department that focuses on health promotion, disease prevention, and emergency preparedness. So it has had a huge impact during the time of the pandemic, and uh, its employees have done a lot of great work. And in recognition of that work, we're excited to see, again, a cost of living increase. A lot of that is going to go down to county boards who deliver local public health services. So these are folks doing the vaccines, for example. Uh, those investments are needed now, really excited to see them. We see a lot of progress since FY 2020, which is $58 million. And of course, FY 2023 over FY 2022, we see $76 million invested. We're really excited to see this. So let's talk a minute to put this in perspective as to where total public health spending has been per person over time. Um, it has been largely flat from about 2016 to 2021. And one thing that we have to think about, and this is a little bit like uh, our policy analyst Ray Calfani's comments on the Department of Labor, public health is something you need in place at all times because you don't know when you're going to need it. It's like the fire extinguisher in your house. It's like the fire department. It's always got to be there to maintain not just a certain level of functionality, but we know that crises happen because we live in a very complicated world. We were in a difficult spot potentially because of the pandemic, because our investments in public health had been flat for so long. So now we're almost back to 2014 levels with a per capita investment of $69.51. Glad to see this. There's a lot more, I think, strategic thinking that we could do about where to invest and when to invest. Uh, but this is what we're seeing right now in the public health space. I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm going to hand this off now to our senior policy analyst for higher education, Jennifer Lee. Thanks, David. So my name is Jennifer Lee, and I'm a senior policy analyst at GBPI, and I focus on higher education. So let's get into it. Um, first of all, let me see here. 
So I'll start with the Board of Regents or the University System of Georgia, which manages the 26 public colleges and universities across the state of Georgia, as well as a few other non-teaching programs, which I'll, I'll go over briefly, but um, about 90% of the Board of Regents budget does go to colleges and universities. And we see a $633 million increase uh, in funds to total $2.8 billion for the Board of Regents. Uh, Acting Chancellor McCartney said during her comments that this was you know, one of the strongest higher ed budgets she's seen in her time in higher ed. And I would definitely agree uh, with the caveat, as it has been mentioned earlier, that um, higher ed and the university system has had a very strong disinvestment over time, just over a number of years, 10, 15 years that, that that disinvestment has occurred. So this is definitely a step in the right direction towards addressing that, that need. Um, just a couple of things that I'm going to highlight um, in addition to uh, the cost of living adjustments, as that has been mentioned by all the other analysts, there is a $100 million formula increase uh, that's just regular formula driven increases for enrollment uh, and enrollment has increased uh, in our public colleges and universities and that enrollment growth really depends when you look at the demographics of our students on both women and black Asian and Latinx students where the growth rates for students is the highest. Um, Danny mentioned earlier some of the funding for capital maintenance and repairs. Uh, it is a little bit unusual. Usually these funds are um, in a separate part of the budget where these the bonds are used for these types of expenses. But this year, some of these um, expenses are in the budget cash funded. And then the last two bullets you'll see, there has been some uh, effort to invest more in two areas of workforce that have always been high need, but where needs have become much more acute in the past couple of years in healthcare and education. So we see some additional funding um, to help educate and train future nurses and teachers. Uh, Danny mentioned the special institutional fee, and I just wanna spend a little bit of extra time on this because this is a really big deal and something that I'm excited to see in the budget this year. $230 million was appropriate to remove the special institutional fee from students' tuition bills. This was a fee that was imposed during the last Great Recession uh, to make up for budget cuts. And it's typically the largest fee that students pay. So for example, a Georgia State student every semester will pay about $1,000 in fees and fully 400 of that is the special institutional fee. Uh, and then unlike other fees that are for specific services like parking or health services, this really was just a way to help pay for operating costs. It, it operated like tuition. So the General Assembly has now um, restored some of those previous cuts to allow colleges and universities to remove that special institutional fee from students' tuition bills, and we'll definitely be watching to make sure that that is maintained in the budget. Briefly, some of the non-teaching programs under the Board of Regents, these include cooperative extension services, which are agricultural partnerships between um, the USG and counties, public libraries, also saw increases for cost of living adjustments and restoration of past cuts. Now, the technical college system of Georgia, another very important aspect of our public higher education system here in the state. Also, the majority of the money going to technical colleges with a, a couple of other um, programs underneath that I'll, I'll go over briefly. But technical college system also saw big increases, a $70 million increase for technical colleges to total $378 million. Just highlight a couple of things here. Of course, the cost of living adjustments that we've seen statewide. In the last bullet, you'll see that there's actually a $23 million reduction in the funding formula due to enrollment decline. And during, during the past two years, technical colleges have seen a 10% decrease in credit hours. And so because of that, there is actually a reduction in the funding formula 
But with the other, other additions, the overall um, picture is still in addition to the TCSG budget. And some of the non-technical education programs, Ray mentioned in his comments earlier, some of these programs around adult education, uh, which provides English language and education services for students, for uh, adults without a high school diploma, economic development, workforce development. Um, these also saw increases in the budget. Um, I'll note the uh, $3 million increase for adult education here. And the last agency I want to talk about is the Georgia Student Finance Commission, which administers both state funded and lottery funded programs. Um, for the state funded programs, uh, the major program to note is the dual enrollment program. And so we saw a $3 million increase to meet the projected need in dual enrollment. And then Georgia Student Finance Commission also administers a number of small state funded scholarships and loans. Um, the most well-known probably being the REACH Georgia Scholarship and funding for all those scholarships stayed flat at a total of $35 million. Georgia Student Finance Commission also administers the lottery funded HOPE program. So um, an overview of the lottery funds here, lottery funds uh, in the state of Georgia fund HOPE and Pre-K, and we saw an increase of $100 million in total lottery funds from last year. That brings the FY 2023 budget of lottery funded programs to $1.4 billion, which is a large amount of money, um, but not as large as <laughs> what uh, the lottery actually reported over the summer at $1.54 billion in lottery proceeds um, for education in the state of Georgia. The lottery also has a separate reserves that is, is separate from the state funds reserves and those total $1.67 billion, which is a staggering amount. Um, 619 of that is required in case of a shortfall for HOPE, uh, but $1 billion of that is unrestricted and could be used for education, um, but is currently being unused and is in reserves. So the largest lottery funded program is the HOPE programs, which saw an increase, overall increase of about $80 million. Um, I will just highlight uh, to the HOPE public uh, which goes towards our students who are attending USG institutions and then HOPE grants here. So um, in addition to meeting projected need, Danny mentioned in his comments earlier, an increase to increase the HOPE scholarship award to 90% tuition at all public colleges and universities and all technical colleges. Um, at technical colleges, the HOPE grant currently covers 76% of tuition. So bringing that up to 90% tuition will be very helpful for students um, in the, at technical colleges. And there's also money to increase the HOPE scholarships to 90% tuition at all public colleges and universities. Um, most schools were already at the 90% tuition, but notably the University of Georgia and Georgia Tech where tuition is the highest um, was lower. And so that'll bring those two schools up to 90%, as well as some small additions for um, Georgia State, Georgia Gwinnett College and Augusta University students to bring everyone up to 90%. Um, this is an area looking at our, our state financial aid strategy and hope is a form of financial aid where we have paid special attention to looking at racial equity. As I mentioned earlier, the, the enrollment increase and enrollment growth in our colleges and universities really depends on our students of color. The only reason we have more college students in Georgia today than we did five, 10 years ago is because of increased enrollment from our students of color. But our um, unfortunately our state financial aid strategy doesn't really do much to address um, barriers that many students of color face uh, as they're trying to pay for and graduate from school. So we see a strong desire from students all across the board to go to college. Um, we, and it's extremely hard, although 
students I talk to are extremely persistent um, to graduate from college when you, your parents are not able to help you pay for a college, when you're working in order to pay for rent as well as pay for your tuition. And so um, um, our state financial aid strategy is definitely an area where um, we could look at what is the racial equity strategy. And then very briefly, the other lottery funded programs. Uh, Danny mentioned earlier that we do not fund a need-based aid program here in Georgia. And actually the largest need-based program that we fund in Georgia is a student loan program. <laughs> uh, student access loans are funded at $26 million. Um, we also have $18 million more for pre-K. That's a total of $401 million dollars in lottery funds and those additions include the teacher pay raise, uh, cost of living adjustments, but also a reduction in formula funds due to decreases in pre-K enrollment the last year because of the pandemic. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Stephen. Thank you so much. Um, I am Stephen Owens, senior policy analyst that work on our K-12 education work and a go dogs to all who celebrate. Want to hit the real top line issues um, for, I mean, these are some huge numbers. So trying to put it in context that uh, the governor's proposed budget includes not only ending the current budget cuts uh, towards the Quality Basic Education Act, that's the formula written in law, uh, which dictates how much schools need in order to be provided the constitutional requirement for an adequate public education that should be available um, by law to every child in the state of Georgia. Um, so this budget not only fills in so that we don't have the budget cut moving forward, but also fills in last year's budget cut through the amended. And so that was $383 million both, both years to get to that minimum level required under state law. Um, also includes $287 million uh, for this $2,000 teacher pay raise. Uh, Y'all know that Governor Kemp ran on a $5,000 pay raise for teachers. And in his first year in office, uh, him and the legislature were able to produce a $3,000 teacher pay raise. This would be the fulfillment of that, pro of that promise. I will say I, the, the uh, date of effect is interesting here. Uh, and this happened the first time with the $3,000 raise as well, where the governor's office proposes that it takes place um, on September 1st. So the fiscal year starts, as all y'all know, on July 1st. By starting this on September 1st, it saves about 16%, but it also means that this first year, that $2,000 pay raise, if passed this way, would be uh, $1,667 instead. So we'll see, there'll probably be some work on that uh, when this budget hits the house, on when this budget takes, uh, when these pay raises take effect, if they are passed. Um, this budget benefits for the big budget for 2023 from about $300 million in savings in these two areas. So local five mil share is a provision in the way that we fund schools that says that each school district um, is expected to fund part of the education of children. And so they take uh, five mils, how much a district can raise in five mils of local property tax. That's $1 of taxable uh, revenue for every $1,000 of the value of the property. Um, and so they subtract that out. And so the state sends like, there's this amount that's required and then subtracts out that local five mil share. Um, and it's gonna subtract out larger from the school districts with higher property values, less for the school districts with lower property values per student. So whenever we see a reduction in this amount, so less that the state has to pay, it means that we're getting more money um, at the local level through property tax collection. Um, that's been true of several years now of we've seen housing prices and property prices grow. And so those collections grow as well. One thing that's rare, however, is uh, the state required to spend less money through the equalization grant. So sitting on top of how we fund schools is this grant called equalization um, because of the uniquely American way that we fund schools where we allow um, huge portions of the budget to be dictated by how wealthy, how much houses cost in the area. Equalization is the state's way of kind of equalizing everything out to provide more money to uh, low property wealth districts 
so they have similar amounts of funds as uh, high wealth districts. Um, and this amount has been growing year after year, which means that the, uh, the difference between our high wealth districts and our low wealth district districts was expanding and the state had to continue to add more and more. This is the first time I've seen it in a long time where we the state's actually had to give less to the equalization grant, which is formula driven, which means that uh, there's uh, the gap between our richest districts and our poorest districts is, is getting a little smaller, which means that this is $164 million less that the state has to put into that grant in order to equalize things. The headline of this is that for the first time in a long time, um, property values are growing and they seem to be growing equitably where our low wealth districts uh, are starting to sort of, you know, in a small amount, catch up with our higher wealth districts. There's still a huge difference between the resources available between them though. And we'll talk about that later. There's also $43 million for student enrollment growth as um, some students that left last year are starting to come back. We're still not getting to that fiscal year 20 uh, enrollment yet, but we're starting to pick back up and regain some of those students, um, as well as $6.3 million in people transportation. Um, this would include 5.4% uh, raises for employees, bus drivers, and monitors. And we talk about student transportation a lot at GUPI, and it's because it's something that we continue to hear about from school districts. So if you have, you know, five school buses that won't run, you can't just say like, oh, well, that's too bad, you know. This is something that's required by law to bus students to and from uh, the schoolhouse door. And so if the money, if the resources aren't there to get your bus driver <laughs> buses um, up to code or even starting or being able to afford bus drivers, then you have to rob from Peter to pay Paul. And so where does the money come from? If you don't have the money you have for student transportation, you have to take it from the classroom because 70% of all the money spent in education goes directly into the classroom. And so this is what this looks like kind of on a statewide level in this graph, which is you can see state funding, that's that gold bar. And that continues into 2023, into this proposed budget. Uh, there's a small increase to 142 million, but you can see how even since it, Bill Clinton was in office in 2000, it stayed around 130 to $150 million that the state will pay uh, for bus drivers, monitors, and student transportation. But the cost increases year after year um, for the districts. So we have gained 250,000 students since the year 2000. The price of labor, the price of buses, fuel, all of these things have gone up, but state investment just hasn't. It, it has been a welcome addition in the amended budget that uh, Danny mentioned, the 188 million extra dollars in the amended budget for school bus replacement. But that's kind of been new in this governor's administration that they pay for school bus replacement uh, through the amended budget. And that is fantastic, but we're probably 300, 400 million dollars away from the partnership that the state and districts used to have in the 90s, where the state would pay 50% of all student transportation costs. Um, in 2019, for example, um, less than 15% was paid by the state. And again, we bring this on because this burden, we bring this up because this burden shifts to the local district. And that means that school budget writers have to find this money somewhere, and it's usually going to come from the classroom. So we're going to continue to watch this until we see significant investment in this area. So what's the missing piece? This is a, a great budget to get us to the uh, legal requirement for how much is uh, supposed to go to our schools to provide the, the constitutional right to education. Um, so that's good that we're, we're starting to meet that minimum amount. We're starting to get rid of these budget cuts, hopefully for good. Uh, but what's the future of education funding in the state of Georgia? Uh, and we're convinced um, that it looks like tilting the scales in favor of the students with the largest challenges in our school. Um, the way we fund schools is that we have additional programs and resources and accommodations to those kids who need it. It's the reason that we pay for an English for students of other speakers of other languages program. It's the reason we provide additional resources for students with disabilities. We don't do that 
We are one of only six states in the entire nation that does not pr provide additional funding specifically to educate students living in poverty. Alabama, West Virginia have left our ranks and have recognized this need that we've known about for several decades now. So now we're just one of only six. This is the way that we kind of move forward in funding and education. And it's something that we uh, continue not to have. We continue to lack in Georgia and hopefully we can move on that this session. So let's talk about those teacher pay raises just a second. And I, I, I wanna look at this uh, because there is a strong um, fiscal argument to be made around uh, teacher turnover, but also it is not the same statewide. And so this is from a report written in 2019 by the Education Law Center um, that we were able to um, help provide some of the data and context with. And they looked at two different years, 2017-18 uh, to 2018-2019. The number of teachers in the state of Georgia did not change significantly that year, but that doesn't mean that the number of teachers per district didn't change. And so they were able to track um, how many teachers left the classroom versus how many, many just transferred to another district. And, and they broke the state down into four quadrants. There are uh, those districts that are teaching majority black student enrollment and lower income. Then there's uh, other low income where you might be majority white. Um, then there's wealthier districts and majority white and wealthy to see, is there a difference between these districts on the patterns of teachers and found that there is a huge uh, disparity between our majority black and low income districts and the rest of the state where we have much larger portions of teachers leaving the classroom and then 7% almost double in the majority white and wealthy districts, which are transferring to another district. And they found that these transfers overwhelmingly are going to wealthier districts in the state. And the, the loss of a teacher in a classroom, besides the academic impact um, that it has on kids, also has a fiscal impact. Because by one estimate, it costs a district 30% of a departing teacher's salary every time a teacher leaves, because that's the amount of money that you need to put into um, professional development and curriculum, just all the accommodations that are needed to make sure that a new teacher is welcome and has what he or she needs in the classroom. So that's on average $17,000 per departing teacher. And we know that our majority black and our low income districts are shouldering more of this financial burden than the rest of the state. And so while just like Jen said, teacher pay raises are fantastic. These raises are excellent. This is the reason that we need to have not just this one size fits all policy of how we fund schools, but we need to have something like an opportunity wait where we provide additional funding to educate students living in poverty so that our districts that are educating these kids can balance the scales and make sure that there are additional accommodations for those teachers that are teaching in those classrooms. Um, again, I'm going to lift up that we welcome y'all's questions and please put them in the chat and then I'm going to hand over to back to my colleague Ray Califani. Yes, yes. Thank you, Steve. So I'm going to go into now uh, Doing multiple ones. I'm going, going to the Georgia Department of Corrections. And once again, my name is Ray Calfani. Um, you know, I focus on working with the standard criminal legal system. And in, in, in this discussion, I'm going to highlight greater insight you know, into the Georgia Department of Corrections and also discuss the impact that the pandemic has had on individuals in the state's custody. You know, with that, you know, just, just going right into the budget, you know, if, if we compare proposed FY 2023. Um, with that of FY 2022, you know, this year has brought significant changes to Georgia's criminal legal system. While the total of previous Georgia Department of Corrections budgets, Georgia Department of Corrections budgets, you know, have experienced significant substantial reductions, you know, in the budget as, as a result of pandemic budget cuts. You know, the amended FY 2022 budget and the new FY 2023 budget will include increased spending to cover uh, infrastructure upgrades and staff paying benefits. You know, and this includes, this will include, you know, along with all the other agencies that we've spoken of today, you know, pay raises and infrastructure, pay raises, and then also infrastructure upgrades and amended fiscal year 2022, as well as 
cost of living adjustments and benefit increases for staff reti and retirees in fiscal year 2023. And, and furthermore, you know, in, in fiscal year 2023, you know, it includes spending to begin expansion uh, or, or reestablish expansion of, of private prisons. You know, what's the administration stated, you know, as part of a $600 million expansion of private prisons over future years. And just for FY 2023, this amounts to a total of 142 million in spending increases compared to um, FY 2022 for, for all spending that the Georgia Department of Labor is gonna do this in this upcoming fiscal year. So, you know, along with that, you know, this is gonna include, you know, there, there's a $5.9 million cut in the budget that was done during pandemic cuts, you know, in fiscal year 2021. And, and this cut was achieved by increasing commissary prices for people who are incarcerated. And it's still maintained in the fiscal year 2023 budget. And, and this means that, you know, despite all of the state funding that's been added to the Georgia Department of Corrections budget, you know, the heavier financial burdens that were placed on inmates and their loved ones to support them during a pandemic still remain. And, you know, this means, you know, that for those inside Georgia's prison system who are disproportionately Black and Hispanic Georgians of color, you know, they would continue to have heightened difficulty in accessing basic necessities, including hygiene products. And then, you know, before I you know, go into the, how the pandemic has impacted the people inside, in Georgia Department of Corrections custody, just want to give you an overview of the population trends over time. And I'm sure many of you know, uh, you know, Georgia passed several criminal justice reform measures that went into effect in 2012. And, and while those reforms brought a welcome steady decline in the, in the GDC population until 2014, they failed to address the broader issue of carceral control, which you know, not only includes those who are incarcerated, you know, but you know, those on probation and parole, you know, many of whom still face insurmountable barriers to returning to the workforce following incarceration and, and avoiding recidivism. And while workforce reentry issues are not only overseen by the Georgia Department of Corrections, the, what, let me say that while, while workforce reentry issues are not directly overseen by the Georgia Department of Corrections, Georgia's priorities in addressing crime, which appear primarily directed towards mass incarceration, must be reoriented to, to invest in methods of decarceration, such as taking the lead on reducing over-reliance on fines and fees in our state, which often forced Georgians who were formerly incarcerated back into incarceration, which then worsens the inmate capacity issues that the Georgia Department of Corrections has an interest in solving. So you know, prior to the pandemic, and, and it's going into you know, population a little more, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, the population was almost at 2012 levels. Now, due to the backlog in court cases during the pandemic, we saw a dramatic decline in, in, in the Georgia Department of Corrections population. However, you know, as you see, you know, as we go on into 2021, population levels have returned to unacceptable levels. And my hope is that, you know, that all of you take, you know, issue with, you know, returning to the status quo of mass incarceration because, you know, continued investment to create capacity to imprison more Georgians is only self-perpetuating and it will continue to lead to more unnecessary human suffering. And then, you know, when we look, when we look at the population of folks in, in GDC's custody, you know, the racism is inherent in our criminal legal system. It's obvious, um, you know, in a state in which black residents compose only about 32% of the population, but 60% of Georgia Department of Corrections population and white residents account for 60% of the state population nearly a but only 30% of the Georgia Department of Corrections population, no one can doubt that the system's in dire needs of substantive reforms towards decarceration. You know, as, as these inequities play a significant part in the unemployment and underemployment of Georgians, Georgians of color, which have persistently doubled that of white and Asian Georgians. And, you know, as we all know too well, you know, COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities. And while the state has been disaggregating COVID-19 cases and deaths by race and ethnicity, the Georgia Department of Corrections has persistently failed to do so almost three years into this pandemic. You know, in the past, you know, we, we've submitted, you know, a few open records requests to the Georgia Department of Corrections, you know, asking for the disaggregation of uh, of their, you know, COVID data by, by race, by ethnicity, by gender, but we're told that no data existed, 
that the department was under no obligation to track it. You know, so the Georgia Department of Corrections must do better. And to date, we don't we don't know the number of COVID cases among this population because they stopped recording that data in July of last year, despite the rise of infections and deaths among the public due to the Delta and Omicron strands of COVID. You know, Georgia Department of Corrections, you know, in their latest reports, you know, show that, you know, nearly 12,000 people in their custody have been diagnosed uh, with chronic illnesses, including COPD, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, you know, which put them in a high risk category of having complications due to COVID. And what was once a prison sentence, you know, what seems to be many years ago, you know, was turned into a death sentence for too many. And the state has a responsibility to transparency, accountability, and to ensure that this doesn't continue to happen. You know, and while there's been, um, uh, you know, investments in, in infrastructure within the prison, I think it's, it's very unfortunate that when we talk about transparency and accountability, that illegal items, you know, such as cell phones, play, you know, one of the only, or not the only, you know, form of transparency and accountability that we can have right now, uh, you know, within the Georgia Department of Corrections. So, you know, I was saying, you know, highlighting the problem, of course, you know, it's not enough. So I want to take an opportunity to, to, to reshare, you know, how we, how we hold the Georgia Department of Corrections accountable for the lives that they are entrusted with. And just want to re-up advocacy actions from the Southern Center for Human Rights to share with you, you know, you know, one of their, legis one of their legislative proposals, which continues to call for, um, you know, pandemic transparency and accountability in prisons. So, you know, with that proposal, you know, people are incarcerated in Georgia prison, in Georgia's prison since the outbreak of COVID-19. You know, they reported appalling conditions. You know, this is nothing. No, we, we've seen this in the news time and time again from what we've been able to get. Uh, we hear this from loved ones who we have connections with. That you know, there's been insufficient personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies, overcrowding facilities that you know don't allow any space for social distancing, uh, adequate testing and an over-reliance on lockdown and solitary confinement as a means of isolating. You know, and for advocates outside of those facilities, you know, obtaining reliable and up-to-date information regarding their protocols for slowing the spread of the virus and providing adequate treatment for those who are sick has, has been unnecessarily difficult. Um, and, you know, and we've heard, you know, from, from uh, you know, the Georgia Department of Corrections, you know, about numbers they have as far as vaccination rates um, and along with booster rates. But that in itself is still not enough. That that is you know such such small information as far as what's needed to know what's taking place and how we can address you know all the problems that are taking place. And when we have a situation where the the legislators that are constitutionally put in place to oversee a system can't even get access to information, I mean it's 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 beyond sad and beyond acceptable. So, you know, as part of efforts to promote transparency and accountability during the current and public uh, future health emergencies, you know, the Southern Center for Human Rights is a longstanding, you know, legislative proposal that will require the Georgia Department of Corrections uh, to report changes to policies and practices in responding to a pandemic within 30 days after, you know, dec declaration of a public health state of emergency, you know, also requiring disaggregation of case data by race and by ethnicity so we can begin to understand you know, how these public health emergencies are being experienced by those in the state's custody. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to my colleague, Crystal, and open it up from there. Hi, thank you all for all of that. Um, I think we only have time for one question, so I'm gonna make it a really nice question. What would the ideal budget that helps Black women and women of color in the caring ecosystem look like? And how are federal funds being used to accomplish this? Um, this is open to whoever wants to answer. Not everybody all at once, no. Um, uh, Steven, I'll start with you. Yeah, I love this question. I think we, we were talking about this yesterday in our uh, networking uh, part with uh, partners for around education. And we talked about how difficult it is uh, to focus in on teachers because it, we, we understand the point of education is to help and support kids, right? But the entire system relies on people that like people have to implement this. And it's been amazing to see what was 
uh, just a few years ago, this desire for a completely technologically driven education where we can decouple schools from the buildings and everyone can just watch YouTube videos and everything will be fine. We're now realizing that is absolutely ridiculous, that we have to have, there's a relationship uh, that's needed in order to spur education. And as we have a teacher workforce that is, at, like Senator Walker mentioned, at the front lines of like what we're doing as a state to support the next generation. That means supporting these folks with, of course, with, with, with pay that they don't need to be ashamed of or that they don't have to have a penalty in order to enter into education. We know that Georgia is one of the worst states in the union of the pay penalty. But also we need to rethink about like, what, what does that workforce look like? We have a majority of our students uh, that are students of color. We know that we need more teachers of color in the classroom and so that means we need to have policy solutions on, on a range of issues. That means, of course, consistent pay raises so that we can get the teaching profession back to where it was in the 80s and 90s where you didn't have a pay penalty. That means continuing to invest in the teacher's retirement system like our state leaders have been doing for 40, 70 years now. But that also means we need to reevaluate the dangerous language we're using about demonizing any perspectives of the history of our country that does not center white people. And so I, I get that there is maybe a political win that can be had by demonizing critical race theory or DEI, diversity and equity and inclusion. This has a real cost in the humans that are in our classrooms, the teachers that we need more of, that need to be supportive, the students who might not see themselves in the way that we teach Georgia history, might not see themselves in the way that we teach our children for the next generation. And so I think that's going to be in the budget, absolutely, but it's going to be on so many different uh, levels of the way that we address education moving forward. Thank you, Crystal, for the question. Um, and thank you, Stephen, as always, for your thoughtful um, remarks. Um, in terms of uh, in the childcare space, um, I think it's a lot of what we heard yesterday from our panelists, right? It is really about um, making the investments uh, that meet the need, right? And, you know, what we've experienced during um, with childcare, um, the childcare system um, during the pandemic. Uh, really rest on having an inadequate child care system before the pandemic. Um, so certainly the federal government has to make significant investments um, to help um, create the infrastructure to make the ch a child care system work, right? Right now, we have families paying far too much for child care. And people who are caring for our kids with compassion um, and love um, and real skill and patience not being paid nearly enough, often having to rely on public benefits just to get by. That, um, it just should not happen um, in you know, the United States, you know, one of the quote unquote advanced countries, right, in the world. We shouldn't be living in a system like that. However, while we do need federal resources, that does not absolve the state from additional contributing more resources to the child care system as well. Um, while we saw, again, um, a $3 million increase over FY 2022, there is far more that the state can do to make sure that um, families um, with low and moderate income can um, receive additional assistance, right, um, to pay for, um, uh, to, to cover childcare, right, um, and thinking about what kind of supports that could be funded by federal and state and local public dollars to support child care providers um, and child care workers who we've heard are women of color who are specifically Black women in Georgia, um, you know, um, 
uh, have those child care providers be able to prepare, to pay them um, a wage that is meaningful, um, where they can take care of themselves and take care of their families. Um, I think this also means thinking about larger, broader policies around um, family medical leave, around, um, as David can, has already spoken to and can speak to more, around um, expanding Medicaid. Um, all of these are critical supports to valuing the work that um, often pays very low wages and where people of color are overrepresented um, in these positions. So finally having um, a, a federal paid leave policy um, would do wonders to help people uh, take care of their families when needed and especially um, childcare and other care workers um, who can't always take, um, currently can't always take time off um, for fear of losing, uh, you know, uh, earnings um, to care for a loved one. So not only is it about investments in the, the child care system generally, but it's also about thinking about um, larger policies um, that would support workers, um, workers as a whole. I'll weigh in really fast. Um, Chris, this is a great question. I really appreciate it. And I know we're short on time, but one of the things I want to point out that a budget is not just an outcome, it is also a process. And so as to what an ideal budget would look like that helps black women, it needs to be an inclusive that includes black women at the center of the decision making and the conversations. So um, the reason we get to a particular outcome or a particular number is reflective of multiple points in, in, of input over time. And Ife, as we heard on the front end with your panel from Tamika, there's so much work to be done to make that process inclusive from the ballot box to the committee hearing to really hearing the stories and centering the experience, not discounting, as we heard uh, from Jocelyn Fry, but centering the experiences of Black women and women of color. If you get the process right, we are more likely to get the number right. And so I think too many times when we receive the governor's budget, then later when we see you know, the AFY and the conference committee, all of those things are reflective of our values, which I think has been pointed out well by this panel, but it's also reflective of the extent to which our system allows those voices to be heard, empowers them to be heard. On the healthcare front, just to mention it briefly, we heard on the panel that I moderated is there is a lot of uh, dysfunction in the way that caregiving is viewed culturally and how individuals who care give, specifically women of color, are paid, including by the feds. So home care is paid through Medicaid, but the rates are not rates that really provide for a livable wage or a meaningful wage. And the same thing I think can be said when we're talking about DCH, DB, DVHDD, DPH. Uh, we have seen substantial pay raises, which is great for this year. Those COLAs really matter. But a lot of those positions are occupied by women of color and they need to be paid in ways that they can can support their families. We heard an anecdote yesterday of a community health worker uh, that was brought up by Natasha on the panel, again, that I moderated. Uh, she was speaking of, of one of her community health workers was homeless, and they were trying to find a place for her to live over Christmas when this uh, young lady's passion was serving her community and informing the community about community health. And this is not acceptable. It really is not. And I think the budget, like you said, Ife, has to meet the need, but we also need to be thinking about the process because the budget is not a destination. It is a journey. We do it every year and, and actually we never stop doing it. We have these points of time like the legislative session, but those decisions are made 365, 24 seven. I wanna add just uh, you know, two, two kind of quick dimensions uh, to this. And, and the first is to say, you know, to David's point, when we think about the budget as well, uh, not just to think about the spending side, but also what we're doing on the revenue side and on the proactive tax policy side. And right now, the, the truth is that statewide in Georgia, when you consider local taxes as well, uh, the lowest income Georgians are paying the most in taxes. And in particular, we see that, that Black Georgians uh, are paying 30% more on average in sales tax, for example, 
uh, and, and that we do have very regressive elements built into our tax code uh, that, that are negatively affecting black women every day uh, and making it harder to move up the economic ladder in Georgia. Uh, and so starting with refundable uh, tax credits, things like the earned income tax credit, we have a child and dependent tax credit right now uh, that's valued at 30% of the federal level. Uh, and, and it wouldn't take that much, less than $100 million to go up to 100% of the federal level. Uh, and, and then to make that credit refundable, uh, which means that it's not just limited to the amount that you pay in state income tax, you can get the full amount that you qualify for. An earned income tax credit similarly could help three and a half million Georgians, uh, could help uh, address racial equity uh, in, in a meaningful way and, and, and help stem uh, kind of that negative tide uh, where, where we continue to see the gap uh, in wealth uh, between black Georgians and white Georgians grow. And then on the other side, uh, we, we know that 65% of our state workforce uh, are women uh, and, and that the largest demographic group uh, is black women with 46% with of the workforce uh, that the state maintains also uh, being black Georgians. And so, you know, when, when we have a median pay uh, at $39,000 that, that's well below uh, what it should be for so many of these industry fields. And, and when we're cutting back on vacant positions uh, that aren't able to be filled because of how low that pay is, so we're overburdening those workers uh, across these agencies, uh, we are con uh, contributing um, to, to many of those negative trends uh, that we see uh, in, in worsening racial equity outcomes. Uh, so the state can start there uh, directly with our employers, but we also have to be mindful of our tax code uh, as well. Uh, Ray and Jen, you each have two minutes. I'll make it really. Oh, go ahead. I, I'll just I'll just tag along to what Danny said. When we just think about having a more equitable sales tax, I mean that certainly can play a part too. When we think about the you know the revenue side of this and how that can affect things such as incarceration, you know, when we if we have a more equitable equitable sales tax, that can be something that can incentivize local governments to not rely so much on fines and fees to fund themselves which can certainly take that financial burden away from those who feel it the most. So, you know, that's some, certainly another way to gain, you know, more equitable revenue in the state and to, you know, uh, place less, less, you know, financial burdens on those who are the most vulnerable. And quickly, I'll just say, when I'm thinking about the ideal higher ed budget for Black women and for students who are caretakers, I think it's important to recognize that if we get our policies and our systems right for caretakers and for black women, that means it's good for everyone. <laughs> you know, I mean, especially when I'm thinking about the disparities that are in financial aid policy and practices, um, you know, putting more financial aid money from the state and the federal level for students with those barriers who may not have that generational wealth, who have caretaking responsibilities for family members or for children. Um, that is some of, I think, just the best investment that we can make in terms of our workforce, in terms of just, you know, human potential and all of those changes uh, made for financial aid policy would really benefit us all. And so um, that's just kind of my overall view, I guess, of kind of how we would think about financial aid policy completely differently if we were really thinking about it from the lens of racial equity and what would be good for um, black women and, and people with caretaking responsibilities. Okay, well, thank you guys so much um, for all of your time. And I wanna thank all of our other panelists for your time today. Um, and up next, we'll be going into closing remarks with GBPI mem uh, board member, Dr. Rabion uh, Charles. Dr. Rabion Charles serves on the GBPI board of directors where she brings a wealth of knowledge about the nonprofit leadership, higher education and deep roots in the Atlanta and Georgia communities. Some of Rabion's past experiences include leadership roles at the University of Texas and most recently, Agnes Scott College. Rabion is also an alumni of the Leadership Atlanta Class of 2019. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rabion Charles.
Thank you so much, Crystal. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you so much, Crystal. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and again, hello, everyone. My name is Rabian Charles, and I have the great honor of bringing closing remarks for Insights 2022, treating care workers as essential, not invisible. As Crystal shared with you, I am a GPBI board member, and I serve in this capacity because I deeply believe in the work of GPBI, work which has been highlighted for you at this, our 16th annual policy conference. Over the last two days, I hope that you've heard four things very loud and clear. Number one, Black women care workers are the backbone of Georgia's workforce, making all other work possible. Number two, racism, disinvestment, and a brutal pandemic have hit Black women care workers especially hard. Number three, an economy in which Black women care workers thrive is an economy where all workers thrive. And number four, we the people of Georgia can make change happen. The paths to accomplishing that change have been laid out before us. On day one, panelists Tamika Atkins and Maria Del Rosario Palacios dug deep into the experiences of Black women in the caring ecosystem, underscoring the value of organizing workers for structural transformation. You also heard from our concurrent panels deep dives on the macro level dynamics and policy levers framing the experiences of women of color and families of color in both the child care and healthcare systems. Our keynote panel surfaced systemic challenges and windows of opportunity, including how racism and gains in women's rights have influenced outcomes for women of color within the care work system. The panel also underscored how a faulty care ecosystem harms entire communities, illustrating that what happens there matters for everyone. Finally, the keynote panel illuminated an unmistakable through line tying together all of it. The political powers of communities of color is directly connected to the wellness of communities of color. On day two, fellow GPPI board member Natasha Reed Rice bridged how the challenges laid out in day one can be met by better policy decisions and more informed public funding investments. What followed was a high level overview of Georgia's fiscal position framed by senior policy analysts for, analysts for tax and budget, Danny Canso. The subsequent panels with state legislators and our very own GPPI policy team then laid out the latest budget developments, policy priorities, and strategic opportunities to support Black women, care workers, and marginalized communities. They connected the dots for us and showed us how dollars drive change, how wise policy decisions can uplift millions. If you've heard anything over these two days that resonates with you, that inspires you, that fills you with indignation, stirs your soul to action, I charge you to join us. GPPI needs you. Georgia needs you. What we do takes hard work, enduring faith, and yes, funding. I shudder to think about or imagine a Georgia without GPPI in it, without its analysis, its advocacy, its courage. GPPI staff can share with you, I'm sure, innumerable stories of how a legislator's heart was turned by a simple statistic, a subtle data-driven argument, or of how a community partner used our data to mobilize and equip those they serve to speak truth to power. This type, of this type of tangible impact would not happen without the generosity and investment of supporters like you who care deeply about Georgia. 
about equity and about building a future where our children and our children's children can thrive. So if Insights 2022 inspired you, if it challenged you or energized you, I want to encourage you to invest in the crucial work we will do together to build a better Georgia this year. You know, progress requires immense effort and often happens slowly, but we are making progress. And with your support, we will continue to make important strides in the fight to build a more prosperous state and create a better future for all Georgians. Your donation today will underwrite GPPI's policy advocacy and timely research throughout the legislative session to make a gift and know that all gifts make a difference. You can click on the link that's in the chat or you can visit the GBPI website at gbpi.org forward slash donate or click the donate to GBPI button located on the left-hand side of your conference platform screen. As a part of our donor family, which we hope you will join, you will receive special invitations to events, timely updates from leadership, and all the latest research delivered directly to your inbox. In closing, thank you again for choosing to spend the last two days with us, over 250 of you. Thank you for boldly, boldly leaning in and for believing Georgia can and should be a place where prosperity is broadly shared and where our most essential care workers are treated with the utmost dignity, afforded the opportunity to prosper and ultimately thrive. With that, the Insights 2022 conference has officially come to a close. I hope you have a safe and enjoyable weekend and please don't forget to take the attendee survey and to make a gift. Thank you so much.